All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you for being here, everybody. Um, I'm really excited to talk about a couple different ways to do virtual ensembles. I realize this is a hot topic, very much in demand and needed in this time. Uh, my name's Taylor. I'm a Soundtrap education specialist. I'm a musician. Can you guess what instrument I play? Uh, sorry, my studio's a little dirty today. Um, but I am going to be walking you through two different ways of um, doing virtual ensembles. And let's get started. So let's just jump right in. Uh, I'm going to kind of give a quick little introduction to what this masterclass series is, what I'm going to cover, and why I'm going to cover it today. Um, then I have uh, the links are just going to be actually in the description for this YouTube video. Um, so if you're watching this YouTube video, the links are right below you. Um, otherwise, check out the YouTube video very soon. Then I'm going to walk you through two different ways of recording virtual ensembles. Um, one, a small group method, another, a large group method. So when I say virtual ensemble, you probably know what I mean, but just in case, I'm, I'm referring to a piece of music that's generally already written. It's not a composition project, it's a recording project. So a piece of music that's already been written that you can distribute parts and individuals can record their parts remotely, virtually from different locations. And um, then you can compile all of that together at the end to make it as if you had recorded that ensemble all together the way we wish we could record it. Um, that's what I'm referring to as a virtual ensemble. Probably, probably many of you already know what these are. Maybe you've already done one. Um, maybe you didn't call it that, but now you know that's what I'm calling it. Um, so yeah, let's get into it. So here are two links. This second one um, is, well, why don't I start with the first one? The first one is uh, a place where you can go to see all of our links to our YouTube channel, to our lesson plans, you name it. That's almost all the links are at this bit.ly link. Um, it's, a, it's a link on our EDU blog. So check that out. That's just kind of your general all things Soundtrap links. If you need to see tutorials, if I mention something that you don't know how to do, you can go to this first bit.ly link and that will probably point you to where you can find our tutorials and learn how to do that. The second link, is where I'm going to put the slides that you're seeing. And included in those slides are some instructions. Um, so you'll, what you're going to see here on the screen, that's going to be at this second bit.ly link. OK, so let's talk about small groups. So the workflow in Soundtrap is going to be a little bit different depending on the size of your group. So there's no technical limit that says it must be five. It could be four, it could be six, whatever. But about five or less students, I would probably recommend you use this method. Um, in which case, you just need literally one Soundtrap project, and you just directly invite all four or five of those students or members of the group to that one project. And then you do everything in that project. So I'll show you that process in a second. But just so, just so you know, that's kind of one process. Small group, use one project, directly invite everybody to that project. The other method is a large group. And if you have a group larger than five, again, there's no exact number. But it's it just the reason I say that is because when you get more than five or so people into one Soundtrap project at the same time, it just gets a little messy in terms of saving and syncing and making sure you're not accidentally on someone else's track and you don't make a change that you don't mean to make. So again, it's not an actual technical limitation. It's just a recommendation that if you have a group bigger than five, you probably want to use the large group method, which involves having two projects. One project is your template project that you use an assignment. You take that project, you create your template, and you share that as an assignment. And then that assignment uh, 
the way that assignments work in Soundtrap, if you don't already know, is an assignment makes a copy for each student. So if you have 50 students in your wind ensemble, then you can create an assignment, share that with your students. If you don't know how to make an assignment, click in the description, there's a video and show you how to do assignments. And you'll, when you share that with your wind ensemble, you'll end up with 50 copies of that, assuming they open it. Um, then each student can record in that template project that only they and you have access to. So no other student could possibly mess up their recording. They record in there, they save it. And then when it's time to compile all of them, you go in and download that and compile it into the second project, which is where you just compile all your recordings. So I'm just giving you an overview. I'm gonna show you how to do all these steps in just a second, but I just wanna kind of talk through the main differences. Small group, large group. Small group uses one project direct invite Large group uses two project, uses assignments, and then the second project is just for you, the teacher, to compile all those recordings. Cool, let's keep going. Uh, by the way, if you have any questions, if I need to slow down or speed up, let me know in the chat. Not the Q&A, but the chat. Um, that is my way for you to me, my way to communicate with you. Um, so let me know if you need anything. Okay. So, like I said, the assignment feature creates a copy for each student, makes you a collaborator, so you can see those copies, and it puts all those copies in a folder, basically to make it easier to find. Okay. And so this is the workflow. Again, this is just an overview. I'm gonna go through these step-by-step, step, but I just wanna show you the overview or show you the workflow for the second method. The first method is, is much easier, so I'm just gonna kind of walk you through this. So obviously the first thing is you need a piece. You need a piece of music that's already written. Then you're gonna create a template project, which is again, uh, well, I guess I haven't said this yet. In that template project, that includes the reference track, which is the step, step three is to upload a reference track. We'll talk more about that in a second. Then you'll add a blank mic track. And then if you need to, you'll add a sync pop track. I'll explain what that is in a second as well. After that, you'll share the parts. So if you have PDF parts or maybe you use smart music, however you need to, you give each student their part, just like you would give them their you know, flute one part, their clarinet two part, pass out the parts, pass out the project. And the way you share the project is as a Soundtrap assignment. Then the students go in there, they have the reference track, they have their part, they record. When they're done recording or they've got, you know, maybe they record a few times, but they've finally found their final recording that they're happy with. They mute the reference track and save their recording. Then you, the teacher, have access to all those recordings. You can download each of them and compile them in your master project. And then you can do your, your final mixing and setting levels. Maybe this kid is too loud, this kid's too quiet. You do all that and then you download the project and share it. So again, that's just very high level. We're gonna go through all these steps now. So the first thing to explain is what is a reference track? And a reference track is needed regardless of which method you're using, small group or large group. A reference track is an audio file used to sync all the individual recordings and you need one no matter what. Uh, the, it, the audio file, AKA the reference track could be last year's group playing this piece, an audio recording of that. It could be a recording from the publisher. It could be a MIDI generated thing from Sibelius or Finale. It doesn't really matter what it is because generally you're not going to include that in the final project, but you need it in order to give your students something to play along with and therefore keep everything synced so that everything lines up. There are other ways to do this. Um, you may have seen Eric Whitaker, his virtual ensembles, uh, virtual choirs, which are amazing. If you haven't checked them out, literally stop watching this video and go, uh, do a YouTube search for Eric Whitaker, virtual choir. He has six of them. I think now my favorite is four. Um, he does it without an audio reference track. He does it with a video conducting track. You could do that, but for the sake of Soundtrap and for the sake of our exercise today, I'm going to do everything audio. It's the simplest way I can come up with to do it in Soundtrap. 
and it just involves an audio reference recording. Cool. So that's what a reference track is. You'll need one. And you can just drag that into Soundtrap, or you can import that file into Soundtrap. Um, a sync pop, uh, I might as well mention it now. A sync pop is a short sound on beat one of a Soundtrap project to help with aligning and compiling your recordings. Now, you might not need one. You only need a sync pop if your students do not record, start recording from the beginning of the project. If, like, if everyone plays starting on beat one and measure one, forget about the sync pop, you don't need it. You need a sync pop if for some reason, like my piece that I'm gonna show you, some sections don't come in until measure 70 or they don't start until measure five, something like that, then you need a sync pop. So again, I'll explain that when we get into the studio, what is it, how do you make it? Um, well, here's, here's a, a hint, a preview. You'll add a drum track and you just put literally a note on beat one. I use a kick drum, it could be a snare drum, it could be whatever it is, just something on beat one and it's a timing mechanism. You're not even gonna hear it at the end. So it doesn't matter what the sound is. Cool. So your final step is gonna be compile all these recordings. So I believe now we're ready to jump over here. Uh, I'm gonna check the chat briefly. And looks like there's a, a question in there. So let me address that. Let's see what we got. Two questions. Okay, is there a license requirement in order to have a large group of students participate? Uh, no. Oh, well, yes. So you need to have a Soundtrap for Education account. It can be, it doesn't matter how many seats you have, but it needs to be a Soundtrap for Education account, not a uh, Soundtrap creator or Soundtrap for Music Makers account. I would assume that most people here will have a school license, AKA a Soundtrap for Education account. Um, but yes, in order to use the assignment feature, you will need that. Another question from Chris, is there a way for kids to access projects by just signing in versus clicking on the assignment that was sent to them or posted on their LMS? Uh, it depends. So it depends on which LMS you're using. Um, the, the thing to keep in mind is make sure they've already created their account. So I'm not going to go through every LMS, but I'll take, I'll take one as an example. Schoology, if the students have never created an account before and they click that assignment link, then it won't work. <laughs> but if they have already created their account before by logging into, that, into Soundtrap, then when they click that assignment link, it'll take them right there. So it just depends on, on your LMS. Um, yeah, they, they need the link. Yeah, either way, they need to click on the link for assignments, AKA large group. So yeah, even if they have an account, they need to click the link. Um, okay, so let's take a look at this project right here, which is a, a, an example of how you might do a small group, uh, a small group virtual ensemble recording. So uh, what we have here is a quartet, obviously it's the Dvorak American Quartet. Um, hopefully it's not too cliche. Um, and so what I have here is I've imported a MIDI file of this quartet. And if you don't know what a MIDI file is, check the links. You can learn more about MIDI files. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about them. And I'm just going to kind of assume that you know generally what a MIDI file is. So I found a MIDI file. I dropped this in and I can see all the different parts. I don't necessarily have to do it this way. I could have all of the tracks all together in one audio file, which is probably the most common way to do it. Just take your favorite recording of this piece or take a recording of last year's group playing it and drop it in here and they can just play along to one audio track. That's fine, that's simple enough. You're welcome to do that. I just wanted to show you this method to hopefully give you a little bit of inspiration on on maybe a little bit more advanced way that you might do it. So you can see each part has, you can see all the notes and this can be useful, especially if you're playing a longer piece and maybe the students wanna, they don't wanna record everything in one take or maybe they can't record everything in one take. This allows you to go in here and see, okay, at measure 129, which I know is actually 129 because I'm using this MIDI file. 
Um, if I go in there, I can click on edit and I can edit the notes. If my mouse will work, there we go. And I can go and see, okay, well, what, what's happening here at measure 129? Okay, yeah, I can see my sheet music right here. Yeah, let's say, okay, cool, I've got a, I've got a B natural. Okay, cool, let me start right there. Um, it just gives you, it just gives the student a little bit more control um, and a little bit more, uh, more options when they're recording. Again, you don't have to do it with a MIDI file. You can just put, throw an audio file in and use that as a reference track. So um, let's continue talking about the kind of the overall workflow for doing this with a small group. Like I said before, when you do it with a small group using this method, you just have one project and you directly invite everybody to that project. So I think I've already invited some people. Um, and yeah, so the way I did that, in case you don't know, is I can either come up here and click share, or I can come to this collaboration tab and click plus, same thing. And then when I do that, it's gonna pull up this window. Yours might look different. If you have your walled garden enabled, you'll only see the top part. If you have the, your walled garden disabled, you'll see what I see. So I can come in here and I can type the names of my students either by, you know, it'll find suggested ones or I can come in here and say, type in another name um, and then invite them. So this is generally just gonna be your students. So here I would invite the four members of this quartet and then they would have access to this project. And you can see, oh, look, Justin's here. That's fun. So I can say, hey, Justin, we'll pretend that Justin is the, uh, the cellist. Actually, I wanna be the cellist. I love cello and I never got to play it. I'll be the cellist, but Joss, Justin, you can be violin one. Um, cool, so this is just an example of how we could text back and forth. Um, and then we can record at the same time or I can record now and he can record tomorrow, it doesn't really matter. We're not gonna be hearing each other as we're recording, but when I make a change or when I record myself and then I hit save, Justin will see that update. So why don't I actually go ahead and do that real quick. So I'm gonna to pretend to be the cello. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a cello here, but I'm gonna record. I'm gonna kind of skip through this stuff. You should know, um, or maybe you shouldn't know, but I'm not gonna go through the microphone setup process. I'm just gonna kind of assume that you know it. If you don't know it, check the link below and you can find the proper tutorials. So I can come in here, set my microphone, pull out my imaginary cello, and put on my headphones and start recording. So let's just do a very brief recording. My cello, I'm sorry string players, please don't be offended. Okay, cool. So I've done my cello recording or at least the first few measures of a cello recording. And now I can hit save. And then whenever I do this, Justin or whoever my collaborators are, if they're in the project and they look at this window, this collaboration window, it's gonna go ding, Taylor made a change. And they can say, oh, cool, sync. When they hit sync, it will sync. And then they'll see what I just recorded. They won't see it until I hit save and they hit sync, um, which just means you, that you'll need to kind of develop some like a good workflow for doing this because um, sometimes one person might save and then the other person saves at the same time and then, then you click sync, but it doesn't get the second person's. So it's just, you need to kind of teach your students to kind of get in the right workflow and the right kind of have soundtrack etiquette um, for saving their projects. But this is essentially how you would do a small group recording. Get everybody in the project, they can record either at the same time, if they if they want to, they won't. Or when I say same time, you're not actually listening to them live and playing along with each other. Anytime you're recording, you're always recording to what's already in here, aka the reference track, or in this case, reference tracks. Um, the other advantage of doing it this way, meaning having four MIDI reference tracks is that you could solo each part. So the cellist could solo the cello part and then record their part if they wanted to just play along with the cello. Um, also, because this is in MIDI, they could turn on the metronome and they could play along with the metronome and the uh, reference track or the reference MIDI track. 
And then they can obviously turn the metronome off. And at the end of it, you won't hear the metronome track. You'll just hear their part. Cool. Uh, let me pause for a sec. Look, looks like there's a few questions in the chat. Let me address these and go from there. OK, does it save and sync override, or is it by track? In other words, how does Soundtrap know which version to save and use or sync? Um, it, it generally will get multiple changes. So even if two people save, when you sync, it should get all of those. Um, to, to get more detail and to get more familiar with that, I just suggest you get your students in a project and have them try it, and then they'll have a better understanding of what the best process is for saving and syncing. Um, one easy way to do it is just not have them all record at once, or if they do record at once, put everybody in a Zoom room uh, or like in a, you know, in a Zoom call together so that they can communicate as they're saving and syncing and figure out, okay, this is the best practice for saving and syncing. Um, great question, Stuart. Is there a way to stop the ding in case they are recording at the same time? At this point, no, there is not. Um, so that's another thing you'll need to work into your workflow. Or if you want, you can use the, the second method that I'm going to show you where students cannot possibly interrupt each other. You won't get the ding, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's right, Jeff. They should be using headphones anyways. Uh, yeah, cool. Uh, Michael has a question. Can I create my own MIDI audio file using Soundtrap to use as the reference track? Um, do you mean MIDI file or audio file? Or do you mean create an audio file from MIDI? The answer to all of those is yes. You could use Soundtrip to create a MIDI file. You could use Soundtrip to create an audio file. And you could use either of those as a reference track. Yep. Cool. All right, I'm going to keep on grooving. Well, actually, are there any other questions about this first method, the small group method? Basically, create a project, add your reference track. It can be audio or MIDI. Invite students directly and record. Oh, how do you sync? Um, you, Jocelyn, if you're there, will you change something and hit save? Um, you, the sync button will show up here in the collaboration tab when someone else makes a change. Um, right now, no one else is in this project making a change unless Jocelyn's there. Um, and um, whenever that happens, it'll show up right here. You hit sync and that's it. Uh, another question, how do you get your reference track to sync with the metronome? So it's not necessary. It's not always possible to do that. It is possible to have your metronome sync with your reference track. If the reference track was recorded to a metronome, like therefore it has its own tempo that is exact and it is, you know, will exactly align to a metronome to a click or you're using a MIDI file, in which case that MIDI file generally has tempo data inside of that MIDI file. And usually when you drop that MIDI file in, that will set the metronome to the correct metronome setting. Cool. Uh, another question from Chris, does it save versions in case someone goes crazy and messes stuff up? Yes, it does. So in order to access those, you just go to file, previous versions, and then you'll see all those versions right there. Right now, they're all saved by me, but you would see a different person. You, you see for each version who saved it and then when that was, and then you can open that and revert to that in case somebody accidentally or on purpose records over another student's track or deletes something that they're not supposed to delete or something like that. OK, so I think with that, uh, let's move on to the probably the uh, most asked about, most interesting aspect and the second method, which is to do a large group. Um, cool. I'm going to go ahead and close this. So let's close this tab. Bye, Justin. And here we go. OK. So before I actually go into this project, let's look um, out here. So now we're in part two, we're talking about large groups, larger than five or so. Um, 
and the best practices for doing a virtual ensemble, obviously. So you're going to want to create a template project and then share that as an assignment. So you can see here, I'm outside of my, my profile. I've already done this. I've already created an assignment. And I can see those copies in this folder right here. Remember that I said creating an assignment makes a copy for each student, puts it in a folder, makes you a collaborator. So that's what we're looking at right here. We're looking at this assignment template folder. Uh, by the way, the name of this piece is called Wings. Uh, it's an original piece. And if you want to listen to the whole thing, you can check the link in the description. Um, so you can see here, assignment template, me and a student, me and a student, me and no one. These are all test accounts, but you get the idea. All your student copies would show up in this folder. Each copy is a, you know, a separate thing right here. Cool. Um, again, I'm not going to show you the the, the process for creating an assignment. There's a whole video, check the link, all the links are there. But basically you click this button and follow the instructions. Cool, so now let's look at my template that I've already made and talk about this process. Okay, so here I am, I'm in the studio, in the Soundtrap studio in my assignment template. And this is the thing that I'll share with my students as an assignment. So they'll each get their own copy. It'll, for each one of them, it'll look exactly like this. This is where they record their part and then they'll save it and then they're done. And then the rest is uh, in the hands of the teacher. Cool. Um, so what we've got going here, we have three different tracks. Let's first talk about the reference track. The reference track is like I mentioned before, something that you definitely need and that's what the students play along to. In this case, it's an audio file. Um, that's what I chose for this. The second track here is where they record. I tried to make it super obvious and I labeled it record here. Um, actually, I probably should have done this. When the student gets it, it's gonna be blank. So there won't be any audio right there. And then this sync pop, we'll come back to. Just ignore that for now. Most people won't need that, so I'm not going to bother you with it to begin with. So I'm a student now, and my teacher has created this assignment, shared it with me, and I had to click on that assignment link, and that brought me to this page inside the studio. I have my own copy. I can listen to the reference track. I can play along. I would likely have my piece of sheet music here, or I have it digitally on the computer, and I'm ready to record my track. So what I would do is... I would, um, in this case, the case of this piece, it just so happens that the brass section doesn't really come in until I think measure 70. Um, so I would zoom in here and I would find close to 70. I might wanna give myself a measure or two lead in to feel comfortable, to make sure I'm hitting my note. Uh, and then I'm ready to record. So uh, I'm gonna do a, a kind of a fake recording because uh, I do not play any brass instruments unfortunately, although I would love to play the French horn. Um, and so we're gonna kind of walk you through and demonstrate what a student would do here. I put my headphones on, I've record enabled my track. I've got the reference track. I've got my part right here and my imaginary French horn. Here we go. I'm gonna start, I'm gonna hit record, give myself a couple measures and off I go. Okay, so please excuse my poor singing. I am not a drummer, or I am a drummer, not a singer. And so there we go. That's my imaginary French horn part. I've played it. Let's pretend that I nailed it on the first try, first take. I'm good to go. So now I'm ready to basically submit this to my teacher. And the only thing that the student needs to do at this point, if you set this up correctly, is 
mute the reference track, and hit save. We're muting the reference track because we don't want 50 copies of the reference track and their part. We just want 50 individual parts. In the master project, we'll have that reference track to align everything up, but we want to just get this student's French horn part in this case. So that's why you mute the reference track. And then you hit save. Very important. So let's say you've done all the steps. You've chosen route two, you've created an assignment, you've shared that assignment with your students. A student has, or all the students have clicked on that assignment link. They've seen something exactly like this. They record their part. They hit mute on the reference track and they hit save. Student's part is done or the students, uh, trying not to use, uh, use a pun. The students are done with this, this process. Now it's time for you, the teacher, to compile all these in the second project, the master project or the place where you compile everything and then publish, download and publish from there. So let's do that. We're gonna leave the template project, AKA assignment project, shift gears from being the student and now we're putting on our teacher hats. So I'm gonna come out here just to show you something and make it extra clear on the process. And then we'll jump into the master project. So again, I'm a teacher now. I am on my teacher profile page. I can see this folder that was created when I created this assignment. And if I open this folder up, I can see three student copies. Uh, I can listen to them from here and say, um, sounds good. I'm not gonna do that right now. And obviously they're, they're blank right now, or no, no, they're not, they're not blank, but I could listen to them and say, yep, sounds good. And then I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna download all the projects straight from this page. So I'm gonna go to this first one from this imaginary student, download, sorry, download either as MP3 or WAV, Probably if you're doing this as a final recording, you probably want to do a WAV file. That's the highest quality audio that you can do. Um, for the sake of time right now, I'm just going to do an MP3 because it takes up less space and it downloads faster. And so I'll come through and download each of these student projects, which is should be them playing just their part and should not include the reference rec recording. Cool. Now I'm going to go into the master project, which I've already created, and I'm going to add these in. So if I jump over here, here's my master project. And you can see up here at the top, I have the reference track. It's that same exact audio file that I use as a reference track in the assignment. And then I've got some recordings already in here, already compiled, all the different Part. So you can see trumpet three, one, trumpet two, trumpet four, one, trumpet or trombone one, two, et cetera, et cetera. So um, now all I need to do is take student one's thing, drop it in, take student two's recording, drop that in, and take student three's recording and drop that in. And for most people, you're done. You might want to adjust the volume. You might want to say, mm, let's see, trumpets a little bit too loud, no surprise. French horn, got to have more of that. Tuba, got to have more of that. Do whatever you want to do to change your mix. You can add effects. You can change the pan. You could do all kinds of things. Um, and then when you're done, you hit save. Give it a minute or two. Soundtrap will mix and master all of this in the background, do a little bit of audio magic, and then you can come up here and download the um, the whole track altogether of all those parts. I just realized I made one mistake. I should have muted the reference track in the master project. Um, generally, that's what you're going to want to do. Once you have all the, the individual parts in here, then you won't need that reference track. You can mute that. Um, so make sure you do that. Okay. I have one last thing that I haven't mentioned and I haven't explained. Um, so let me explain that and then I'll take some questions and see what else I need to go through. I have not explained the sync pop thing. Um, all I've said is that you only need it 
if you're not recording starting at measure one. In my case, I wasn't. Students were recording at measure 70, I think. And so if I had not done a sync pop and they had come in here, so if I mute the sync pop um, and, and they went like this and they hit save, whenever it saves, whenever it does a mix, and I go to download that audio file, it's only gonna download exactly this much. Which means when I come in here to compile everything, I'm gonna get a file that is like that. And so when I drop it in, I'm gonna say, oh crap, does that go at the beginning? Or is this for this first horn part? Or does it go for the second horn part? Or does it, is it, did it, it, I know it goes here, but did they record at 70 or did they add an extra measure at the beginning of silence? So I don't want to have to play those games and listen to each individual recording every single time. So that's the whole reason for the sync pop. When I do the sync pop, which is just very simply a note on beat one, check this out. I just made a new drum track and I added a note on beat one. Doesn't even matter what the sound is as long as it's on beat one because I'm going to get rid of it anyways. Since I did that, uh, these projects, or excuse me, these individual student recordings have that sync pop on beat one, AKA a bass drum sound, sounds like this. But now all I need to do is highlight all three of those and just cut out that sync pop. Now I'm done. Now I hit save and I'm ready to export this and share it with the world. Cool. So I realized that is kind of a, a crash course. I moved quickly. Remember that you can check the link, um, check, the, check the description below for the link to these slides um, that have kind of the instructions. And I walk you through the steps one by one. So you can kind of use that as a reference point. Cool. So let me take a look at the chat and see what kind of questions we have and see what I can do. Okay, question from, I can get my Zoom to cooperate. Okay, first question from Michael Humphrey. Is there a way to lock the format of some of the tracks so they can't touch the sync pop or the reference track? At the time of recording, today is December 7th. No, that is not possible. Um, but if you're watching this recording in the future, that may have changed, in which case, hopefully I will have updated this video by now. Um, but in the future that may change, but as of right now, no, there is not a way to lock a the format, which is why that's the, the whole reason that I recommend that you use the assignment feature is so that you don't need to lock them out of other students tracks. Um, in this case, the sync pop, you'll just have to trust them on, but for now, that's how it is. A uh, question from Paula, depending on the student's tech, sometimes there is a lag on the recording. Is it as easy as dragging it around? Um, in the master project to place it properly in those cases? Yes, it is. So like, let's pretend that uh, student three right here is slightly behind, right? You can either come up here to the top right and unclick this magnet, which allows you to scooch it left or right with very fine control, or do what I do, leave that on, but hold command while you do it. Probably want to zoom in too hold command while you click and drag, and that will allow you to move it with little tiny movements with really precise control. But um, hopefully you won't even need to do that because um, what I would recommend is um, the students, when they record, make sure that they don't change their audio device while they're recording. Sometimes, even if you're on a nice computer or a not so nice computer, it doesn't really matter. If you change your audio device, AKA like you unplug your headphones or you plug your headphones or you do something weird in the middle of the project, that can create sync issues. Even more commonly than that is using Bluetooth headphones. If students use Bluetooth headphones, they're gonna have a delay, it's gonna be off. So recommend or really require that they use wired headphones. Um, so hopefully you can avoid sync issues altogether by using wired headphones and um, not changing your audio device. And you can go into settings and change the sound quality to low or extra low. Don't worry, it's not going to 
forever change the recording quality. It's just a temporary quality change to the playback. So if you can do all those things, hopefully you can avoid it completely. But if you still end up with sync issues, you can do what I showed you first, which is to come in, hold command and scooch it a, a little bit left, or a little bit to the right. Okay, next question. Sylvie says, can the teacher communicate to a student within Soundtrap that the recording needs to be redone? Yep, so that's the great thing about uh, assignments is you are a collaborator already. So you could come in here and you could type in the box and say, hey, Taylor, your French horn recording is one beat off. Can you re-record? Um, the only reason you're not seeing that text right now is no one's actually in this project. Um, as soon as someone joins this project, this window will, you'll be able to text in it. Cool, moving right along. Question from Jeff, suggestions for effects, effect chains for a whole bunch of laptop microphone recordings. Uh, I would honestly go ahead and go with the template that's already there. So if I say add new track, voice and microphones, computer mic enhancer is already there. It's added by default. Uh, in case you did it the way I did it from the very beginning, which is to just drag that file in and create a new track, um, you can click on this and then you can go to this thing right here. And instead of clean, you can change it to that same thing, computer mic enhancer. That just does a little bit of compression, a little bit of EQ, and is kind of like a preset for exactly what you're asking. Okay, next question from Carol. If they didn't mute the reference track, can I open their assignment up and then copy, cut and paste their track in? Um, you can solve that problem, but not the way that you're suggesting. So if the student is in this project and they forget to mute their, their reference track, then yes, you can open their project. You can come in here, you can mute it for them and then click save and, and download that project. You won't be able to do exactly what you're saying, which is to come in here, copy that, and then jump in here and paste that. That won't work, but you can just do what they should have done, mute it for them, save it, download, and then go from there. A uh, question from Josephine. What if students don't have access to a microphone and or headphones? How does that work? Will it impact the final project? Uh, yeah, I mean, if they don't have a microphone, then they can't record. It doesn't need to be a special microphone. They can just use, like if all they have is their Chromebook or their phone or their iPad or whatever, they, all those devices have microphones built in. So they can just use that. If they don't have headphones, that's trickier um, because the no matter what, if you're recording with speakers, AKA not using headphones, then the microphone is going to pick up that reference recording and it's gonna make all of the individual tracks have an extra layer of that reference recording, which is going to sound bad. So they don't need fancy headphones, but they pretty much do need headphones. Another question from Chris, can you explain more about the sync pop? I understand the idea, but how do you use it as a reference? Okay, um, so you don't actually, the great thing is once you set it up, you don't really have to think about it anymore. You don't have to like take the sync pop and align it with something. Um, let me show you a little bit more. So I said, add new track. I chose a drum track and I added a note on beat one. I, w I went ahead and did it in patterns just because that's the easiest possible way. You could do it in the piano roll or you could record it, but no need, just use patterns. And then I labeled it and then I basically forgot about it um, on purpose. So once the sync pop is done and it isn't muted, it's just going to um, force Soundtrap to export from the very beginning, meaning it's gonna, that, that uh, audio file of each student's recording that Soundtrap exports is going to have all this empty space, which we want. We want all that empty space from measure zero or measure one all the way up to 70 or wherever you're recording. And adding the sync pop and keeping it audible forces that to happen. And then when you're done or when the student finishes, you drop in that student track and it's gonna have that sync pop there at the beginning and all you have to do is just cut it out and you're done. Cool, another question from Chris. Can you show me how a trumpet player could start at measure 70 and how the sync pop comes into play? Yeah, okay, cool, yeah. So I think I just explained it. 
Um, any way to avoid having to download each file individually, like a batch download button for all recordings in assignment? Great question, Paula. Great feature suggestion. So far, that's not possible. Um, but I will add that to our list of things to build. And someday that might be possible. Um, cool. Oh, no, you're, you're good, Chris. Don't worry. Um, OK, so that's basically everything I wanted to get through. Uh, I'm happy to answer more questions. I will make sure to drop the all the links in the YouTube recording. That should be up by tomorrow. Um, I'll also post it in the Facebook group to um, make sure it's easy to find. But you can also just go to our, our Soundtrap for Education YouTube channel. Keep in mind, there are two YouTube channels. There's Soundtrap and there's Soundtrap for Education. You want to go to Soundtrap for Education. Um, cool. I, I will hang here for a few more minutes and answer any questions. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much for being here. I hope this was helpful and I wish you all the best. Also, I would love it if you would share any recordings that you create. Um, as you may or may not know, my background is in teaching music. I'm not really teaching so much anymore. Um, so I love to be able to see and live vicariously through you and through the work that you do with your students. So um, let me know, uh, send me a link, either drop it in the Facebook group or um, you can send me an email. My email is just taylor at soundtrap.com. And uh, I'd love to see what you've done. Have a great night, y'all. Let's see, here's a question um, from Michael. If I had the beginning of one of these, would I be able to share or participate with you on it for a few minutes? Oh, um, yeah, if you have, you'll need to have your walled garden disabled. Um, so I would recommend Michael, just send me an email and I can make sure that's taken care of and we can maybe set up a time if you wanna go one-on-one -on -one and, and look at it. Um, question from Kim, suggestion for how to get orchestral percussion. Kids don't have instruments at home. Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, so we do have a few instruments in here so they could just play a software instrument in which case they would go to add new track. Uh, let's just say keyboards for a second. And then if you click on this instrument, you'll be able to see pitch percussion. So not, we don't have everything, but you've got glockenspiel, marimba. Um, you could probably substitute a xylophone with one of those things. We've got steel drums, timpani, tubular bells, AKA chimes. Oh, there we go. Xylophone is there, vibraphone is there. Um, we have drums, the, oh, the drums are not gonna sound like a Pearl Philharmonic snare drum or like a concert bass drum, but you might find something that could be a good substitute. Um, and then you could just, they could either play, so they can either play a softer instrument by clicking on the screen, or if they have a touch screen, they can literally just touch the screen, or you can use just your regular computer keyboard and that will correspond to notes on the keyboard. Or finally, if, if you have a MIDI keyboard, if they have a MIDI keyboard, they can plug that in. Um, but they do not need one of these. They can just use whatever device they have um, and record it using that. Um, yeah, so hopefully that's helpful. And that's that's my best advice for orchestral percussion if they don't have the instruments at home. Um, if you are a little bit more computer savvy and audio advanced, you might be able to find some percussion samples online. Um, and then make those samples available to them and then they could like drop them in. Um, but in terms of playing, I would go with using a software instrument like I just showed. Um, cool. Let's see. Um, couldn't, oh, sorry. Okay, sorry, Kim. Couldn't find the right instruments. Yeah, you'll just have to kind of go with what you have and make substitutions. If you are a little bit more adventurous, you could search online for some orchestral percussion samples, and they could drop those in. Um, question from Chris, can you use markers like the big numbers in boxes on music or color code areas or regions? Um, yeah, so what you can do is you can use blank regions. And the way you do that is you add a new track, 
any kind of software instrument will do because it doesn't matter. We're just kind of using them as dummy tracks. And then, so if I want to create a new region and then I probably want to drag it out. Oops, let's zoom in. Excuse me. There we go. So let's say I want to mark off the first 16 measures. So I make a blank region for 16 measures. I can go to edit, edit name, and maybe call this intro. Whoops. Um, and then I could, if I pull this down, I can actually read it. And then I could copy this for other sections. And maybe the next section is the verse or something. So I go in there, edit the name, label it verse. Whatever it is, you could label it like that. So that's kind of a hack to work around that. You will have to stay on the same color for each track. So I can't make this one pink and this one orange. Each track has to stay the same color. But you can change the color, which is you come to here, come to that track, click on these three little dots, and you can change the color of that track. Cool. Um, yeah, so that's those would be my pieces of advice on kind of making markers. Um, like I said, the top numbers here, the measure numbers work if you recorded or if your reference track was recorded to a click or you use a MIDI reference track. Um, I know you can use MIDI and measures, but if it's an audio track, is there a way to put markers on sections? Um, not exactly, just have to kind of follow those steps. Oh, a uh, question from Carol. How are you selecting or moving multiple tracks at once? You can either click and drag and like highlight like this, like you would on like your desktop, and that will highlight multiple tracks, or you can shift click. So if I click on this track and click, sh or I hold shift while I click all these other tracks, that will highlight multiple tracks. And then I can drag them or, you know, cut off the beginning of them all together. And then if I want to undo all that, which I do all the time, Command-Z, Command-Z, that is undo. Cool. You're welcome. Thanks for being here, Chris. And looks like there's one last question in the Q&A. Snuck past me. Just looking at my other screen here, trying to grab this and read it. Let's see. From Amanda. Oh, um, cool. I'll follow up with you in, in just a second. Uh, well, thank you everyone for being here. Have a great night and I wish you all the best.